Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Janet Palmer to you. Janet is the Ofsted National Lead for PSHE Education. And as Joe has said, Janet is going to talk about the Ofsted 2013 report on PSHE education that was released in May. Thank you, Janet. The report is not a triannual report like we've done before. I don't know if any of you had a chance to see or at least read the, the, the key findings. But the reason I didn't do a triannual report was I did trawl over the last three years' worth of data. And frankly, I didn't think it told us anything new. And I'd actually changed things. It made them a bit more rigorous in the last 12 months. So I thought, I'm going to base it on that. And in that rigour, the main thing I wanted to do was actually talk to children more, not find out what they've... The, I'm told that they're covering, but what they've actually learned. I'll talk about that a bit more later, about assessment. Talk to children, you know, you find out. And I also wanted to get children's voices more by doing, including in this, an online survey of young people. And so yeah, their voices come through the report, which again, I think is really important. So this was, th that was the sample. It's not enormous, but it is representative. That's the main thing. It totally covers all types of schools right across the country equally, rural and urban, small, large. Um, it covers all of the um, types of schools, in, also in terms of their grades that they might have received at their offset inspection for Section 5, except Grade 4. We're not allowed to go into schools that are in special measures, but it covers all the others. So let's look at some of the key findings. Okay. So it's the main ones, really. I said it wasn't good enough. <laughs> Because it was good or better in 60% of schools, but it was requiring improvement or inadequate in 40%. I mean, that's just, it's not good enough, is it? Um, I don't think it is, anyway. So that's the title I gave it, and I got away with it, so I was quite surprised. Um, SRE is the bit that always hits the headlines. That was the second bullet point there, because it required improvement in a third of schools. Now, I'm going to go on to argue about how important SRE is. So the fact that a third of children are not getting it, they're getting good SRE, or sometimes any at all, um, can't be good enough. And the, what I was tending to find was getting a different story from primary schools and secondary schools. In primary, where it was inadequate or required improvement, it was usually because they didn't really do the sex bit, they just did the relationships. And in the secondary, it was the other way around. They just did the sex bit and they didn't do the relationships. So uh, that, was, that was what the children said. That was their biggest concern. So that's quite interesting. In one school, let me give you an example of a school um, with inadequate PSHE in a primary school. You might have come across this. The pupils got two hours of SRE in the last week, in fact, the day before the end, last day of term in year six. You know, the fact that even happened, the bit of the school I went to, I've discovered it also happened at my nephew's school as well. I mean, way too late if you're experiencing puberty for a start, isn't it? Particularly for some of the girls. Um, and they couldn't ask any questions. You know, the teacher, obviously the teachers didn't want to ask any questions. Last day, we're all having a party. Don't ask me any questions. You know? <laughs> so that was a bit worrying. And with the secondary, the main opinion of the students there, I said that... They weren't discussing feelings, but it wasn't just relationships. They wanted to think, they wanted to discuss sexual and emotional feelings, controversial issues, issues like sexual abuse, homosexuality, pornography. And I asked the panel, well, I didn't ask the panelists this. The question to the panelists, Ofsted has this sort of group of young people, representative again, right across the country, who get involved in, like a focus group, who get involved in different surveys. And uh, they were just asked, what would have made PSHE education more useful? And they said things like, this was a shocker, rape culture, more about that. What to look for in a healthy relationship? Gosh, rape culture. Anyway. Okay, more findings. None of this will be a surprise to you, I'm sure. Um, I'm not saying, later on I'm going to look at the outstanding stuff, which is nice. But <laughs> so, but... Again, going back to age-appropriate sexual relationships education. And the thing that most worried me was talking to children about whether or not they knew how to keep themselves safe. Linking, linking this to safety as well. And so many, I don't think they did. They didn't really, weren't really in a position. They didn't, hadn't been taught the right language. How, if you've never been taught, which has been taken out, hasn't it, for the primary, and, and uh, body parts, being able to name body parts, um, sexual body parts. If you don't know that, how do you describe what might be happening to you? 
if it is. It's very, you know, we're, we're disempowering young people here. I mean, anything here that I found was completely borne out by much further research and um, carried out much deeper research than I was able to do by Childline, Lucy Faithful Foundation, NSPCC. What we, I was asking my inspectors to go in and try to get good examples of good practice in helping young people protect themselves from unwanted physical or sexual contact or sexual exploitation. Uh, we only really found a really good example, actually, in a special school, and that was nice to see. Very good practice in sexual safeguarding. Staff, parents, carers getting regular talks from the local police, community support officer, child exploitation and online protection groups. But it wasn't commonplace in other schools, and it needed to be. Some people had heard about stranger danger, but none of them mentioned simple, man simple mantras, which is a simple one with children would be, you shouldn't keep adult secrets. You can keep surprises, because surprises, you find out, that's the, gonna, you, can, you know, a birthday surprise, present, that's different. But keeping secrets, no. There's no possible reason in the world why a child should be asked to keep a secret. That's a fairly simple mantra. Um, and I, I mentioned about not knowing the proper names of things. Um, let me move on. Listening to staying safe again. About half of the pupils, half of the schools, they'd receive lessons about staying safe. But what worried me, they'd receive lessons, but only in the better schools had they had a chance to practice the skills that you need to apply the lesson. Um, negotiating your way out of a risky situation, role-playing ideas, getting those. You need, don't you, those assertiveness skills to stand up for yourself um, and get out of a difficult situation. The other thing about applying the, what they'd learned was about applying security settings. I know there's going to be a lot more work on this on, online, but I spoke to children in primary and secondary schools who had learned about, oh yeah, we've learned about applying security settings. How many of you have done it? No, most hadn't that I spoke to. Hadn't actually done it, or they hadn't updated it, or they, didn't, they knew how to do it, but they hadn't bothered. So it, there needs to be a lot more work done there. Um, Another thing, I'm, I'm going to mention this about safety as well. Other people might not think it's a safety issue, but I think it is. Issues to do with body image. I think that's a, a safeguarding and a safety issue as well. Um, I saw one really good lesson on this. It was a group of, sort of I think it was year nine, and they were discussing physical and mental health implications of image manipulation. It was an ICT lesson, fantastic. ICT stroke PSHE lesson, looking at airbrushing of images, before and after airbrushing of images, and to advertise, to portray the perfect body image. And it was an eye-opener for most of them that these weren't real people. You know, this, you can't possibly live up to this image because they don't exist. And in terms of mental health, which is an issue that came through a lot from the young people, um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, issues of mental health are really uppermost in their mind that, that they wanted more work on this. And lack of information about their human rights. This is a safety issue as well, and the protection in law. One of the things that I, re I mentioned in the report, again, I didn't have a huge amount of evidence, so I drew on evidence from the Home Office, was about the 24,000 girls under the age of 15 in the UK today who are at risk of female genital mutilation. And we don't discuss it in schools, or hardly at all. Um, so where do they know where to go? How do they protect themselves? How do they not keep adult secrets and express their fears and get help? To date, there have been no prosecutions. It's illegal in this country. There have been no prosecutions to date, however. And if anybody thinks, well, it's cultural, well, I would compare it to foot binding. That was cultural as well. And it was very similar. But you could see foot binding, and it was horrific. And it hobbled a woman, so she couldn't run away. This is just another way of hobbling women, but hobbling them sexually. And it's hidden. But it's no less abusive as foot binding. So it's something that we really must get to grips with. And PSHE, where else is going to be the place where it's going to be discussed? Let's move on. So what do the children say? I, I've put some of their quotes through it. These are quite interesting. About safety. Lessons should be aimed at ensuring the pupils know what they can do to keep safe. Yeah. I think it would become more useful if you were given examples of what you might come up against. I think you should be taught what to do and how to react to different situations. 
Another worrying one. How about something on sex abuse? My question here is how engaged are young people in your schools in actually deciding what should be in the PSHE curriculum? They know what they want. They know what they need. They know what they need more than we do. Um, and, if, and a good curriculum will be one that has been con constructed, I think, with the, with the young people's voice in there. So, economic well-being. Knowledge and understanding of budgeting and economic enterprise. That wasn't too bad. It was better in secondary schools and primary schools, as you might expect. It was also much better than the last time we'd looked at it in, in 2008. So 2010, sorry, 2010 report. It's much better than that. We've got a careers guidance survey. I've been involved in this, looking at a, a, a good practice in careers guidance since the changes to the funding. And that's due to be published, I think it's this month or July. Very soon, anyway, very soon. Um, I'll mention just again a bit of good practice on money management in a primary school that I went into. Um, it was really nicely done because the pupils gained their knowledge of financial matters and money management through these mathematics themed weeks. They are maths and PSHE. Very good. Um, but it included, what it did, of course they ran a tuck shop and they had all these different tasks about prices and profit making. And they also had to understand the difference between debit and credit card transactions and do these pretend credit transactions and things. So they, they got a, a, a good, quite a good understanding that way. And in the survey, m most of the pupils in the survey wanted more on money management and careers. Even though it had come out fairly good, they still wanted more. Okay, more findings. The teaching. Hmm. It fits in really with the overall message, doesn't it, really, about requiring improvement. Um, teaching required improvement. Well, why? it's no surprise, is it? The second bullet point, too many teachers lacked expertise. They hadn't, there's still no funding for initial teacher training for PSHE. And until the subject becomes statutory, there isn't going to be. So it's still a consideration that kind of anybody can do it. You know, you're a geography teacher, you can have a go. Because this is what happens. It results in, as I've said here, topics such as sexuality, mental health, domestic violence being omitted from the curriculum. Wherever I went in on my team went into a school where, where we found the curriculum sometimes looked better than it actually was. The curriculum often looked good, but when you talk to the children, whole chunks of it hadn't been taught. And it was because the teachers really didn't have the confidence, the skills, the backup, the support to be able to do that effectively. And I don't blame them for feeling nervous about it. Um, the last point there, subject-specific training and support was often inadequate. In 20% of schools, they'd received none. Heaven's sake. You know, and in none of those schools was the PSHE good. That's not a surprise, is it? Um, as you'd expect, in the very best lessons, the pupils' thinking was really challenged and, and lovely, beautifully challenged through excellent questioning. You know, when the, the teacher, what worries me sometimes in some PSHE lessons, especially where the teachers lack the, the training and the confidence, is any answer is a good answer. Yes, marvellous, you've answered. You know, rather than actually challenging them and playing devil's advocate and getting them to think harder and getting another child to challenge them and really, really deepen their thinking and their learning and, and make it, you don't have to come out with all the answers at the end because often there aren't simple answers. Um, I'll give you another example of a really good lesson that was it, because one of the things I put about using resources really well. The best teachers use resources really well, but they didn't have to be all singing or dancing. I was in one school, it's actually mentioned in the report, it's Walton High. Um, they said they didn't teach PSHE because it was everywhere. And I just thought, oh, God, no. I know what that means. But you know, it was. It really, really was. And I went into a lesson, a tutorial lesson led by a science teacher. And they were just looking at a photograph. It's a simple resource, just a photograph of a person, you couldn't tell if it was a girl or a boy, standing in an, a doorway. In a, in, it was at dusk, and they're standing in a doorway, and you could see a bus stop in the distance. And they just got them thinking about how you might be in a vulnerable situation and what you might do if that were you. Who might that person be? Could it be you or could it be somebody wait, waiting to jump out on someone or could it be someone who was lost or hiding? And who, if you were in that place there, what, would might, what do you have to make sure if it were you? And there's a bus stop there and what, what does it mean? And they went through all, the children, it was superb. They went through all different ideas and they talked about how important it would be to make sure your phone was charged to be careful not to walk down places unfamiliar. And they knew it all, but they had to talk it through with each other. And the only resource was just a simple photograph. And it worked really, really well. Okay. 
More findings. That's what I said. The weakest aspect was assessment. Um, but it's a tricky one. What I found really was, it wasn't just that. It was the assessment was weak, much, much less robust than for the same children in other subjects, even if the teacher taught them in other subjects. But there also, the expectations quite often were lower for that child in that subject than in another subject. Um, I saw work of a child who's the PSHE teacher was also the history teacher. And what I did and got my team to do was that to ask to see the child's history books. And you would see this fantastic work, beautifully marked. Piece of PSHE work on a scrap of paper with a footprint on it, you know. And you thought, ah, no wonder the children have a negative view sometimes, the subject, because the teacher wasn't putting the same amount of effort in. Um, so, or they just had, it was just a different view. Or maybe it didn't think it mattered so much. They were the history teacher. That was their main thing anyway. So they maybe been, had no choice and had to teach PSHE. But about assessing learning, I don't think it matters how you assess the learning, but you do need to know whether or not they've understood. The simplest way is to ask them. Really? Just ask them. <laughs> Through questioning, you know, you don't have, it does, it could, you want, if you want to do a pencil and paper test, do one. If you want to do a project, if you want to have children teaching other children, all kinds of ways you can do it. But I find the best way is, not, is just to find out by asking. Ask at the end, go through the key points at the end of a module to find out if they've really learned it. Have their misconceptions disappeared or have they still got them? And make sure you don't just ask the usual sus suspects and find imaginative ways. But it doesn't have to be the same as you assess other things. It's a different sort of subject, but you do have to know. You've put in all this time and effort in. Did they learn it? You need to know. So, and not just what they've covered. Okay. So again, what did the children say? Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I think PSHE should be taught by a teacher in that field, rather than the teacher who doesn't know anything about the subject, but still tries to teach it. Most of it's doing worksheets, you don't learn much. In most years, we just covered work we've done in previous years. I want to talk about that, actually, because I found one of the questions that I would ask if I've seen children doing five a day again, you know? I've, they probably did it in year three, they're doing it in year six, they're doing it in year nine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Quite often, though, I'll watch a PSHE lesson and say, in year nine, say, and say, could they have done this in year seven? And if the answer is yes, then it wasn't challenging enough, was it? You know? And sometimes I think you'd be, people in secondary schools would be surprised at the level of work they've done in primary sometimes. What I'd like to see, you want to see in a lesson, isn't it? It's not just children answering questions, but asking them. I mean, that's wonderful, isn't it? When they trust you enough. Again, one of the outstanding schools I've mentioned in the report, uh, it was a Catholic school in Stevenage, I think it was. Uh, uh, John Henry Newman, I think it was. That was lovely. The kids so trusted their teachers, they'd ask them anything, anything. Um, and if the teacher didn't know, they'd find out for them. That was lovely. Um, let me move on. Curriculum. Now, curriculum was good or better in two thirds of the schools. Um, most I'm not saying there's any one way to teach PSHE, but what we found was it was most coherent and comprehensive where it was offered as a discrete subject. Um, it, could, it can be taught in other ways as well, effectively. It's just a lot harder. Um, where I found there was a problem at Key Stage 4 in some schools, where it wasn't taught discreetly and it was picked up in other subjects, at Key Stage 4 it often depended on whether or not the child picked particular options. If they'd picked business studies and health and social care and one or two other, and, and, and um, sometimes even history, if they picked up subjects like that, they were likely to still be getting their PSHE, but if they didn't, they might not be getting anything if there was still a reliance on those subjects. So. That's not me. More findings. I better move quickly, haven't I? Um, I also concentrated a little bit, which we hadn't done before, really, on those... Because when I go into schools, they do say, well, we do all these other extracurricular things that contribute to, to PSHE. And it's true, they do. Um, but, and we found that to be... But where it was happening, it was really very good. But what I think you need to make sure you do, and this is good... Go back to your schools and say, this is really, really good evidence for SMSC when it comes to your Section 5 inspection. You really need to convince the inspectors, and but you need to do it anyway, is to monitor who's doing all this extra stuff. Is it all the usual suspects, the usual 50 kids that do everything? Uh, and, it, and do you know who's not taking up things, who's not getting engaged and not, not being involved in all these different, uh, different opportunities to contribute to the school? Um, and why are they not? And find ways of get, making sure that they all do. 
leadership and management. It's just over half of it was good, just under half wasn't. Um, it was key to whether or not the PSHE was good, as you would imagine. Um, back to training, it, was it wasn't just teachers that weren't adequately trained, leaders weren't adequately trained either. PSHE subject leaders often hadn't had any proper leadership training, particularly in primary schools. And the, the, the main problem I found, they didn't have given, given time, didn't have the proper training, didn't have time to meet with, as a, with a team in secondary schools, certainly, and didn't, weren't given proper time to monitor and evaluate the quality of teaching and learning. In this, 20% of the schools were outstanding for PSHE. And that was where, to be honest, the head teacher saw it as an absolute priority for the school's work. It was at the heart of the school's work. Um, the teachers were well trained. They had an accurate view of their strengths, where they needed things they needed to work on. And the, the, the curriculum was also regularly reviewed by pupils and staff and parents to make sure that it was relevant. Now, that was the, they were the main findings of the first part. I'm just going to, in the last five minutes, talk about the second part of the report, because it's something you can go away and use now if you, if you choose. The second part of the report, I, you could use to sort of see where you think you are. It was, I just wrote about characteristics of those outstanding schools. We had 12 out of the 50 were outstanding, and these were the characteristics in common. And then I mentioned the characteristics of those schools that required improvement or inadequate. I'm just going to look now at the outstanding, because it's nice to finish on a high, isn't it? Um, those pupils demonstrated excellent personal social skills, what you'd expect, and they shared a sense of pride. Um, we saw all of these things in these, good in these outstanding schools, and I said before, and everybody was involved, it wasn't just the usual suspects, that was the main thing. Um, this was a nice one. The pupils in these schools could really describe what they'd learned. They could really articulate it with maturity, with enthusiasm. It was lovely. They went, they were very, it was very evident when they were talking to inspectors. Confidence to discuss sensitive, controversial issues. You could ask them about anything and they'd say, oh yeah, we did this and I could talk to you about anything, whether it was sex and relationships, drugs, alcohol. Um, and they were happy to, uh, in the lessons, to listen to each other as well and respect each other's differences. They were independent learners. I'll give you an example of that. Um, in, in one school, some people set up a website and it, to raise awareness and gather opinions about local issues, social and environmental issues in the local area. Um, another group uh, researched and delivered assemblies uh, during LGBT History Month, and they delivered them for, and then produced some um, lesson plans for teachers to teach for Year 7. So very, lots of great independent work there. Um, Activities that they can work on, use their initiative, good subject knowledge from teachers, all the things that you would hope in an outstanding school, and well-chosen well resources. So lovely ones here sometimes, where you're giving children sometimes some tricky questions to answer, not easy ones, like, well, isn't teenage pregnancy a good and natural thing? Maybe it is. What else? Yeah, the, 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 it wasn't one size fits all. You did make sure there really was an opportunity for children to be challenged. Um, you saw that in the best schools, it was great. Um, oh, I'll ex and this, I'll, I'll give you an example, year three class, fabulous. Year three class, different ability groups working at, with various levels of teaching support. There were actually two teaching, uh, two TAs and a teacher in the classroom. And the question they had to explore, and they went for a complete range from a child with very severe downs to some extremely smart little cookies there. But they had to look at the question of how to ensure a new child joining the school could make friends. And they, some of them, the ones that were the least able were focusing on how they would feel themselves and the teacher helped them with emotion words and they had to point to the words and guess them in year three um, to think about how they might have been helped. But others were really exploring a whole range of different scenarios of different types of children who might come, a non-English speaker, a deaf child, a disabled child. By the way, these year three, they were brilliant. They all signed anyway because there was a, a deaf child in the year, so all year three signed. So it was fabulous. But so the idea of the way they were stretched it took, in all different ways in that class. It's excellent. And the other two points really is about these, the importance of ground rules. It's the first thing you learn when you're training to be a PSHE teacher, isn't it? That's what keeps you safe and keeps them safe. Um, and so many teachers who go into this without proper training don't realise that, and you learn the hard way, don't you? 
Other issues? I'll be really quick, can I say? Um, this is just the outstanding. This is ring. It should say teachers used to questioning. I noticed on the train I'd missed out the word. <laughs> teachers used to questioning. I mentioned that before. I mentioned assessment, innovative, cre creative curriculum, regularly reviewed by pupils. Um, they will tell you what they need. They really will. And you really ought to have some bespoke SRE and bespoke work for pupils who are in challenging circumstances, those with special educational needs or disabilities. It needs to be channeled and needs to be tailored to, to, their, to their needs. Nearly finished. Enrichment programme, we've mentioned that before. Monitoring and analysing the take-up. All the best schools did that. And then the bit I mentioned before about school leaders. They champion PSHE. They're trained. They monitor. You might want to have a look at the... Or if you get a chance to look at the report, do that. Or you might want to have a look at the PSHE website. See, I've nearly finished. For good practice reports. Because some of them are mentioned in the report. But have a look on... If you go to Ofsted PSHE, our expert knowledge, you can find... All the, all the good practice reports on there, which are really helpful. Um, we plan, I'll talk to you about this later, to do some work with the PSHE Association and maybe Public Health England as well to provide a practice, a good practice guide, which hopefully we'll be launching this time next year. Um, and I say, meanwhile, have a look at this part B when you see the report and, and use it in your own schools.